in seeds, uh, the Willamette Valley is a world-class production zone. There are only three places in the world that have the geological and weather patterns that we have here. For any place where seeds are grown commercially, there's always an association and a system set up to try to prevent cross-pollination between people growing crops. So in the Willamette Valley here, we have a map which has pens on it, which shows where various crops are being grown. And we have to consider there are self-pollinated crops, which generally do not get contaminated. There are insect pollinated crops, which require uh, moderate distances for separation. And there are wind pollinated crops, such as sugar beets, that require long distances because the pollen travels on the wind for a long way, especially if it's windy. This represents the South Willamette Valley going down to Eugene. And you can see these are the specialty seed crops that are clustered. You can see how they're clustered along this side of the valley. So there are no grass seed uh, fields on here at all. This is only specialty seeds, which includes uh, all the crops that I grow, as well as sugar beets and onions and spinach and radish and uh, spring and fall members of the cabbage family, including mustard greens and cabbage and broccoli and stuff like that. And where would you be on this? And I'm right here. You can see that um, I had to make a special note here because my property is actually just off the map. I'm, I'm right in this zone here where there's no, uh, the map actually ends right there along Bell Fountain Road, um, which is a mile to the east of me. The flags are color coded to the crop and the idea here is so a seeds person can look at the map and see what species are being grown where. And if a person has put their pen into the map, uh, you're supposed to not take that same color within their isolation zone. How easy is it for cross-pollination to occur? If it's a wind-pollinated crop, all you have to be is downwind within range. And within range, might it, uh, there are no clear-cut answers. You cannot say that after 600 feet, everything's fine. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, or even a mile. This is a biological and weather-related process. And so here in the valley, we've set up these standards to try to take into account both biological, landscape, and weather considerations, as well as market considerations for what the seed is going to be used for. That also matters. And so to prevent cross-pollination, uh, we've, we've set these standard distances that things need to be separated by. So for many crops, the standard distance is one mile, um, which means that if I'm growing a crop of uh, a radish here, uh, as a member of our local seed growers association, the gentleman's agreement is no one else will grow a radish crop within a mile of me. Once I put my pen on the map, I have located myself. And now according to our gentleman's agreement, which is not backed up by any law. Now different regions, like over in Madras, Oregon, they have a little organization. Up in the Puget Sound area, there's an organization up there. Um, almost, well, virtually anywhere in Idaho, in the Treasure Valley. So, all of these locations have these organizations and they're set up to police themselves. Interestingly, they, different regions use different isolation distances as their standards. And that's because there's no one way to say how far pollen will travel. It's de it depends, just like everything in ecology, it depends. But here in the Willamette Valley, for an insect pollinated crop like a radish, 
that's an open pollinated type, we provide one mile of isolation for that person. However, if I was growing a red radish and you were growing a white radish, the distance would be two miles. And the reason is because, as opposed to if we were both growing white radishes, we would allow one mile. Now this gets into the intended use part of the deal. If a white radish crosses with a white radish, most consumers are not going to see the difference. It's not going to matter. It's not going to have a market effect, a market value effect. If a white radish crosses into a red radish, people notice that because the white radishes tend to be long and white and the red radishes tend to be round and red. And when you get a cross between them, it's obvious. And for this reason, uh, we provide two or three times the space when the crops are different colors or have a trait that's contrasting. Well, in the case of wind pollinated crops, such as spinach, the normal distance might be two miles or three miles. Two miles if it's a similar type, three miles if it's a savoid versus a flat leaf type. You see that? And this has to do with the consequences of contamination between the two. If the consequences are small, then we put them closer together. If the consequences are big, we put them further apart. In the case of beta vulgaris, sugar beets, table beets, chard, from sugar beet to sugar beet might only be one mile if they're all hybrid GMO sugar beets. If you have a non-GMO sugar beet and a and a GMO sugar beet, they're supposed to be three miles apart. If it's between a table beet, which is red, and a sugar beet, which is white, they're supposed to be five miles apart. And that's because you don't want reds and whites mixing. And they sure don't want any red beet in their sugar beet because that makes pink sugar. Nobody likes that. Well, that sounds festive. Um, so, what should the distance be between a GMO sugar beet and an organic red Swiss chard? Well, the rules say four miles. Strange, it's not five, <laughs> but... Uh, because that presumably would wipe out your market if it were contaminated, is well, that correct? Well, it's really the sugar beet people that they're worried about. <laughs> and if it's, or, if it's an organic separation, now this is the hard part, and this is where the dynamics of constrained size of the valley come into play. Sure, from the organic consumer's viewpoint, you couldn't get my shard far enough away from a GMO to give everyone complete peace of mind. They would, my, my buyers would love it if the distance was 20 miles. The problem is, if I couldn't grow within 20 miles of a GMO sugar beet, I couldn't grow seeds anywhere in the valley. Do you understand? There is nowhere in the valley I can get 20 miles from a GMO sugar beet. It doesn't exist. So this is the dynamic tension in the seed production areas. You want to fit as many seed crops in as possible so that you can grow as much seed as possible, so you can have as many farmers doing it as possible. But once you cram them in too close, then you start getting contamination. And then your customers globally notice, and then you are a less desirable place to grow seeds in. So the dynamic tension is fitting as much in as possible without compromising the quality of the seed being grown and the reputation of our region as a seed growing region.